Julie Schmidt served as Chief Executive Officer at the Woodwinds Health Campus for over a decade. She was responsible for leading the vision, creation, and implementation for this new and innovative approach to healthcare delivery, which incorporated a holistic model of care, healing environment design, and most importantly, a hospital with a culture of compassionate service. This was followed by her role as Chief Transformational Officer at Health East Care System, where she drove strategic initiatives and business growth to help Health East Care System achieve its milestone quality goal of becoming the benchmark for quality in the Twin Cities area. Most recently, Julie was inspired as President and Founder of Journey and Leadership Pathfinder which provided leadership coaching for leaders wanting to boost effectiveness and for newly appointed leaders transitioning into a new role, along with candidates needing to be groomed for succession. Julie is now enjoying retirement, traveling, and time with her family. Well, Julie, I just want to thank you for being here with me today. This is a, a significant honor for me to have the opportunity to connect with you, interview you. You are one of the top three most influential leaders in my life. And I don't know if I ever had a chance to share this with you, but I was a fairly new nurse and I was standing in the grocery store checkout line and I looked at the counter to my left at the magazines and you were on the cover of one of them. And I remember being drawn to your smile and kind of your pose and your just like you have this like natural leadership that just kind of seeped from even the photo. Um, and I looked at the title and it was something to the effect of executive nurse leader and I was like oh she's such a badass I'm like this is awesome <laughs> and so I was so excited to read more about you and then we had like this whole thing unravel where our life started intersecting more and more and more um but you are a true natural born leader to the core like one of the few people I can say that is actually I believe born to lead and you did it with great grace and success. So I'm so excited to be sitting here with you today because you've been such an inspiration to me and now I can share more of you with other people. So thank you for being here. Very humbling and a lot of pressure, Krista. It, well, so. that's my intention. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I know you're good under pressure, yeah. so I'm not, I, I don't know. We'll I'm see. fully confident you'll be good. Um, but you know, back in, it was 2001, I was a, a new nurse graduate. And as I was thinking about where I wanted to go in my career, I had a couple of different draws. One was like emergency medicine. The other one was more integrative medicine. And I had a few people plant these seeds like, hey, have you heard of this place called Woodwinds Hospital? Hey, have you heard of this CEO uh, named Julie Schmidt? And I was like, well, I haven't, but just tell me more and tell me more. And the more I heard, the more I'm like, well, I gotta go check this place out. So I remember, um, kind of walking into the doors and taking a tour of Woodwinds Hospital. And there you were leading this group of healthcare administrators from somewhere in Asia is what I remember and being like, oh my gosh, she's so innovative. She has people flying in from all over the country to find out what she's doing here at Woodwinds Hospital. And it was really different than anything then. And I would argue it's still really different than what exists now. So can you share a little bit about the vision you had for this Woodwinds Health Campus and how you took that from a painting in your head to reality in a hospital? You know, I think it was a, at a point in my career, first of all, before I got the job, there were, a, there were a lot of people interested in it. Why I got it was kind of an interesting story where yeah. they did really a lot of interviewing, um, went through a lot of psychological tests okay. and uh, motivational, which I had never had in any other jobs that sure. I had. Anyway, I landed the job and I'm thinking, oh my God, now what do I do? This, right. is, this is an opportunity as a nurse with an MBA yeah. to really create something and it was at a point in my career where I had sort of no fear mm -hmm. and I really think one of the best and most important characteristics in a leader is courage mm -hmm. and I'm calling myself a leader just because you are but I'm, mm -hmm. I think it doesn't the position doesn't necessarily create the leader it's mm -hmm. really within any person 
So I think courage was something that um, was instrumental in sort of throwing caution to the wind. Mm -hmm. and, and deep in my soul, after all the years of experience as a nurse, mm -hmm. thinking about what would be the, what is the, what are the issues with patients? Right. What's the most important thing that we as healthcare workers mm -hmm. can do to really create that um, ultimate patient experience, yeah. not just in service, but in the care they get, um, in the environment they have, um, and, and just in the staff that we hire and all that kind of thing. Yeah. So we really had an opportunity to um, uh, have a, come with a clean slate right. and, and really create something from the ground up. Yeah. So I, I really look at it as an honor, sort of the ultimate opportunity I've had in my life. And I've done a lot of other things, but um, this was um, you, a unique opportunity. Yeah. So uh, first of all, you know, creating that vision of what we want to, what this is all about. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't just mine. Mm -hmm. I would be the first to say that. We pulled in a lot of staff mm -hmm. um, that worked at some of the affiliated hospitals, we mm -hmm. pulled in some of our leadership, some of the architects and and um, folks that had been in other places mm -hmm. um, to really help create that vision and then um, followed that up with some, I think, very strategic and important guiding principles yeah. um, along the way. So the, one of the most important one was hiring the right staff sure. at the beginning to really create that culture. Yeah. Yeah, that so, was instrumental. And I yeah. remember signing, I don't know if it was like a commitment form of how I was going to show up every day as a nurse. Passionate service Com promise. Passionate service promise. Thank you for that. Right. And I remember just thinking that set such a good intention around what I was signing up for because it was something obviously kind of innately in there as a nurse, but it was a formal contract right. to just say, I'm going to really show up like right. this every day. Well, you know, it's about setting expectations, right? Yeah. So... Um, we thought let's let's be really clear about what our expectations are, so that staff that come here they know what's expected, mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. people are really um, interviewed at the end of the year, or they're evaluated mm -hmm. on their ability to provide compassionate service. Yeah. Um, that is one of that's one key thing they're evaluated on. So why not set expectations so you don't have a lot of issues later? So right. no one told me this, or so it was an actual formal signed contract. Yeah. Also, for any leaders we hired, and I interviewed every single leader, mm -hmm. um, the leaders signed an even higher standard, which was a, a, a leadership uh, mm -hmm. service promise, and it was okay. based on servant leadership principles. Yeah, I love that. So, you know, their, their expectation was to serve staff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if they didn't think they could be a servant leader, mm -hmm. then they could decide this wasn't the place for mm -hmm. them. And, you know, no offense, but... This mm -hmm. is what uh, we need. This is the kind of culture we're trying to create. Right, right. So, can I ask in your role, and you've had a few, so I mean, Woodwinds, you know, being kind of, I'd say one of your like, I mean, that had to be kind of your baby. I mean, you just created something That's so right. beautiful there. And just to kind of paint the picture for people, um, there was a grand piano when you walked in, playing incredible music by different musicians, fireplaces, access to outdoors and to the sunlight. Um, there was always essential oils. There was healing touch. There was therapeutic music. There was acupuncture. I mean, and this was 20 plus years ago. It's becoming a little more common now, but 20 years ago, this was state-of-the-art, cutting edge. I mean, creating a lot of buzz in the healthcare, on the healthcare street. Um, and people invested quickly. Do you think that was, did you have to pull more on, say, like the healthcare professional side of yourself, which, you know, had been a nurse for a num number of years, or more of your like MBA leader self? Or was it a good 50 50 to make all of that come together and get the buy in that you did? Um, I think it was probably more on the, um, nursing side okay. because it's like what is going to create the kind of um, situation that is going to help patients and yeah. and I you've you've touched on a few creating that healing environment is mm -hmm. was sort of only only thought of by a few people mm -hmm. I think in certain circles in the United States at the time mm -hmm. and maybe beyond because we had tours mm -hmm. coming from all over the world right. like you said right. so just the importance of a healing environment uh, was I think 
not recognized before that. And I think the other was the model of care. So right. we had more of the traditional Western medicine and then incorporated um, many of the other, mm -hmm. um, what was considered then more alternative, but mm -hmm. now it's more integrative mm -hmm. um, services um, and uh, to that, and then creating that whole culture mm -hmm. um, that staff could really um, perform and shine like yeah. a, in a way they never did before. Right. So those three elements, I think, were sort of key um, successes and then a lot of things underneath that, but right. um, those were three of the ones that I think are the most important. Absolutely. And I'm sure that you had a lot of naysayers. Like, oh my gosh, yeah. Yeah. And so it how was did like you... needing to, I, I remember those early days, because yeah. especially in some of the physician groups, um, the naysayers, mm -hmm. but, but it's like, I remember telling some of my, the few leaders that we had on board early before we opened, mm -hmm. put on your blinders and earplugs. Do not listen or look at what anybody's saying. Mm -hmm. Forge ahead and do what we know is the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. And then once we opened and had all of these um, services and were integrating things, then it's like all of the other physicians came out of the closet and said, mm -hmm. hey, we think this is great. Mm -hmm. But they were not brave enough, I think, to do that mm -hmm. and maybe didn't feel supported to do that um, right. early on. But, you know, so maybe that's a lesson for all of us. Right. Just do the right thing and, you know, irregardless of what mm -hmm. the naysayers are saying. You know, one thing that you did that I still remember to this day and have n and I never experienced since this moment at Woodwinds was you came up to the floor and you and one of the pastors had a bowl in which you would bless the caretaker's hands. So the nurses, the doctors, respiratory therapists, PCAs, whomever it was. And I was like, wow, that was such a powerful statement to me that you understood kind of the depth and the hardship of the work at hand and the kind of the sorrow and pain that you sometimes hold here. But you, it was a way to honor that and recognize that. And I'll never forget that. And I thought to myself, she could be doing probably 5 million other things right now, but she is intentionally like being here to give her utmost leadership, like healing energy to those going then to try and heal and take care of others. Well, and that, again, that came from my background as a nurse. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's about body, mind, and spirit, right? Mm -hmm. And acknowledging that it, you have to be well-centered, well-balanced mm -hmm. to all of that, but taking a pause, understanding that, you know, we're not in this world on our own. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we really care every day mm -hmm. for the patients. It's really an honor and a, and a privilege yeah. and a blessing for us to be able to serve and to I don't know, acknowledge that I thought was yeah. really important. It was, it, it was really impactful mm -hmm. to be quite oh, honest. Um, and just the whole experience of being there. And of course in healthcare, you know, there's no perfect, but I would say you created as perfect of an environment as possible. Um, in, in an environment that's really hard to create any version of perfect, quite frankly. Um, so just, I can say for my own self, it's made a huge difference. And I know it has for others too. Um, you know, it's kind of interesting. I think a lot of healthcare professionals start out kind of in one realm or one area, and sometimes they stay in it, but oftentimes they find themselves going different directions, which is kind of the beautiful part of at least nursing anyways. Um, for me, you opened my eyes to that idea of alternative integrative care in profound ways where I could see firsthand by calling in a healing touch practitioner into a room where I'd given a patient probably more narcotics than, you know, you would normally give someone like enough you could give a horse and probably cure some of their pain. And I'm like, I can't get anywhere. Like there's still a 10 out of a 10 in pain and feeling like I had nothing else to do. I did at Woodwinds because I could call in a healing touch practitioner. I could offer some other things. And I was even a little skeptical at first. And then I called in my first healing touch practitioner and they asked me to stay in the room with the patient and them. And their pain went from a 15 out of a 10 to a five out of a 10, which is a huge accomplishment. 
And I was like, whoa. It's amazing, isn't it? This stuff is powerful. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't even know exactly what it is, but it's really powerful. And it, it just made an impact, you know, where I'm like now thinking already, like, we have so many other ways to health and healing. We haven't even like cracked the surface. Right. But you took the iceberg and you looked a lot deeper. Well, I, I think we learned so much out of that, too, and that, yeah. that would be one more reason why I am confused about why other more conventional and traditional Western medicine doesn't see this, because using healing touch or some of the other modalities really cut down on the narcotics, mm -hmm. cut down on the costs yeah. for, the, for the hospital, for the staff, yeah. for the... Um, in, for the patients, right. um, there are many examples of that, uh, like some of the healing oils and so mm -hmm. forth that we used. Mm -hmm. The uh, anesthesiologists were poo pooing it, and mm -hmm. but the nurses started using different healing oils and would mm -hmm. put them on cotton balls and tape yeah. them on the front of a, a, a patient's gown, and their nausea was like. Seven yeah. percent, whereas in the the average for the U.S. was fifteen to twenty-five percent, and yeah. and they're saying what what are what's going on? What are you doing? And right. and they'd go to one of our affiliate hospitals, and yeah. and they would say, I don't know what they're doing at Woodwinds, but right. but you need to do the same thing because right. we want that lower rate here. Yeah. So you know, and we really never were able to fund a research program. We were mm -hmm. part of many of mm -hmm. them. Um, that might be one of my regrets, that we didn't find mm -hmm. funders for that. Mm -hmm. Julie, can I ask you as a leader, why do you think that there's kind of this common underlying resistance to change different, new, for so many people, and just maybe culturally? That is a great question. I've asked myself that. I'm not sure I have a good answer. You know, part of the excuse in healthcare, because other industries change all the time. Right. In fact, they're maybe ahead of healthcare in the digital world or other other electronic world or other things like that. Mm -hmm. um, for the excuse for years has been, well, this is patients' lives. This mm -hmm. isn't a factory line. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, that that's true to a point, but mm -hmm. unless we start making some innovative changes, right. it's never going to get where it could be. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and I think there, maybe with some of the new, because I think with some of the new physicians coming out of medical school yeah. over the last 10 years even, yeah. things are changing. Yeah. They're much more open um, to really challenging mm -hmm. the status mm -hmm. quo. Um, experiencing things, some of the internships they have are mm -hmm. in places that w never happened mm -hmm. 40 or 50 years ago. Right, right. So their eyes are open to other kinds of things. Right. Maybe um, them personally taking care of themselves. Yeah. Um, they've learned some things and can pass it on to patients and, mm -hmm. and into their healthcare world. Mm -hmm. That's That would be my hope. The hope. So we are in 2023, about just shy of three years post-pandemic or middle of pandemic or wherever we are in the middle of kind of this whole change in the world. Um, and I will say I kind of, I went back into healthcare very briefly during the surge to help in whatever capacity I could. But for the most part, I was just on the sidelines like you were mm -hmm. watching with kind of this mixture of relief and regret, right? That I wasn't absolutely. like absolutely in the arena, like with everybody else. Right. And we talked a little before this, and I think you were having some of those same feelings. It was very difficult sitting on the sidelines, mm -hmm. and I wanted to dive in. And it, my friends would say, "Are you crazy? This is COVID, and it's really hard work." And but you know, it's difficult when you really care about what's going on. And I, and I just wanted to step in in some way to help but mm -hmm. it just wasn't the time and they were cutting mm -hmm. back on staff and at the you know in a lot of at the beginning at least right and um so i just couldn't find necessarily other than some volunteer work a role right that maybe i could serve but yeah it was very difficult yeah on the I would, sidelines i would imagine because you're like such a go-getter <laughs> always too that you're like just let me in but i look at the generation that I grew up watching as leaders, which is certainly you. And I think, I hope somebody was calling you and going, Julie, what would you do in this situation? Like, how would you handle this? And this is a major global healthcare crisis. So leaders such as yourself, 
being asked for their wisdom and knowledge and experience. And I remember we talked about this and I was like, were you getting calls? And you're like, "Mm -mm." not really. Yeah. Maybe just a little bit, but not really. And I, I, I think about that. Did I ever at, at an earlier stage in my career call people that were retired yeah. or, you know, 20 years beyond, did I ever call for, ask for advice? And I didn't either. Yeah. You know, and I think about that for my mother who recently passed away, mm-hmm. who was almost 99. Yeah. She was still, you know, very sharp and had so much wisdom. And I think the last few years of her life felt like, you know, what value am mm-hmm. I and what can I add? And that's what happens to people when, they, when they're when they retired, unless they have a good good plan about mm-hmm. what they're going to do. Mm-hmm. Um, but healthcare needs that. And I, mm-hmm. and maybe healthcare has too many leaders. Mm-hmm. That's an interesting, yeah. 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 So, so there's, yeah, there's so yeah. many, they don't, they don't need anybody else's perspective. Sure. But getting away, stepping away, you know, as someone who's retired, from that um, field, right. stepping away, there there might be some wisdom yeah. the perspective. And mm-hmm. clearly, someone like me, who's been out of the, the industry now for a few years, you know, I probably don't know what all the pertinent mm-hmm. issues are. But healthcare is kind of different because we all think we know about health care right mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and we all need health care right in your lifetime ever it, it is it. it is part of everyone's life yeah. so we all have an opinion and maybe mine would be a more educated opinion yeah. or be able to give the opinion of a, uh, a consumer of yeah. health care yeah the perspective of what things look like these days right right you know, I watched the same thing unfold with my dad, who was also a leader, and he retired, and they had an office for him, you know, where the n- nearby the new CEO's office, and I think within, like, two months, he's like, just, I don't even need that anymore, because right. nobody really wants my opinion anymore. Right. I'm like, how did that just happen? Because you're one of the smartest I people I know. Like, I tap into your wisdom all the time. Mm-hmm. So if you could have shared anything with leaders kind of during these last three years, what would, have, what would be a couple things that you've thought of that you know you just haven't had like a platform to say hey here's some things i would have considered you know i I keep going back to the employees it's really all about the employees and 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 seeking out what they think yeah the solution is ah okay as opposed to feeling like as in a Mm -hmm. position of leadership feeling like you're obligated to have the answers Mm -hmm. i never thought that i don't think that today Mm mm-hmm Sometimes I wonder if that isn't the case and if mm-hmm. organizations aren't getting so big mm-hmm. and talking about getting bigger mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that um, it's it's really a danger. And I had a very wise colleague years ago say, mm-hmm. it just it always comes full circle. Mm-hmm. And are we waiting for that? And, and if that's the case, what's the next full circle mm-hmm. thing to happen instead of getting bigger? Mm-hmm. Are we going to all all healthcare organizations going to shrink. Ah, uh, interesting. Okay. But again, my the answer to your question would yeah. be, and my first thought would be, you know, go back to the employees and say, yeah. what do we do? Hey, yeah. it's our problem collectively. Right. right. Instead of just having the leaders sit around a table. Uh-huh, I mean, and I don't know if they did that. They may sure. have done that. Sure. I don't know. You know, I don't know how much the public is aware of the fact, um, but probably more so than usual, just because of the news coverage around burnout in healthcare um, happening at such a rapid pace, understandably so, given the last three years that have occurred. But it's not necessarily a new topic in healthcare. I mean, healthcare burnout has always been there. And some of that is like the uncontrollable nature of the job. Mm-hmm. And then within that uncontrollable like sphere, there are things that can be controlled, both intrinsically and extrinsically. How did you best address burnout, um, stress management, um, you know, just this kind of dangerous fine line of people, you know, walking in the world of like, how do I care for others and care for myself? I think the way I learned how, for me personally, how to handle it was all the mistakes I made early on in my career. Sure. Yeah. And I did let myself. You learned a lot from those. Yes. Yeah. So, but bringing that forward was maybe being aware of it myself, Mm -hmm. sharing it with with staff. Mm -hmm. As we created strategic plans, I would have my staff and, and, uh, you know, leaders all create 
strategic personal plans for their own health. Okay. And what were they going to do? And then um, tried to be a role model. Yeah. That it was okay to actually take a vacation. Mm hmm. Um, and to use your vacation mm -hmm. and to encourage and to be happy for staff when they did mm -hmm. and to um, just be authentic about mm -hmm. that's okay and that this is a tough industry and it is mm -hmm. like no other and it is um, you know a privilege to work in this but along with that comes you know mm -hmm. the, the weight of being burned out mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because you have to keep your tank at least half full yeah and how yeah. do you do that? And that might be, that's different for everybody. Right. But I'm encouraging people to do that. And mm -hmm. if they understand they have to do that because they can't, mm -hmm. you know, take care of patients if they don't, mm -hmm. that maybe gets more to the point because mm -hmm. as caregivers, we're always thinking of somebody else. Right. Other than ourselves. Right. And it's hard to shift that culture in healthcare to give people permission to, you know, take care of self. Because our mission, right, the root of our mission is like, no, we care for other people, and do that really well. But sometimes to the detriment sure. of our own selves. But it starts kind of with the leaders going, we're setting this culture of permission around taking care of mm -hmm. self. Yeah. Right. And and to really. Um, let people know it's okay and, mm -hmm. and if they understand the why mm -hmm. the why they're doing it yeah they'll, they'll which is what worked for me right understanding that the better I take care of myself yeah. the better I can take care of everybody around me we'll return to rebel and be well in just a moment but first a few words about our sponsors I want to say a special thank you to everyone at self-esteem brands we are grateful for the recording space and support you have provided to our podcast platform and team. You can find more information about self-esteem brands in the show notes. We appreciate and savor every sip of Dry Farm Wines during our podcast conversations and every event at the Point Retreats. To find out more about Dry Farm Wines, find their link in our show notes. Thank you, Paddle North, for being our preferred Minnesota-based brand and company. We honor every memorable paddle. To find out more information about Paddle North, Find their link in our show notes. The Point Retreats and Rentals is situated roughly 30 minutes outside Brainerd, Minnesota. The property's private peninsula boasts over 1,500 feet of stunning shoreline spanning three lakes on the pristine whitefish chain of lakes. Whether you need time to renew, reset, or reconnect, we have a space that can host your family, group, or team. Click on the show notes to find out more about the Point Retreats and the Point Rentals. Julie, I, I wasn't necessarily going to bring this up in our conversation, but it's just kind of naturally evolving and feels like a good fit. You know, I lost my first colleague to suicide at oh. Woodman's Hospital, and you were there, and that meant a lot. Um, and, and we had probably, relatively speaking, a really good work-life balance on our unit. We had a really great team. We had so many things that I think most other hospitals don't have. And it still snuck into our space. Mm -hmm. And I remember just being so devastated, like, what? This happens? And being kind of young and naive, and I was probably even like a little hot-headed at the time, being like, this has to change. But it was really eye-opening to go, this is the worst consequence mm -hmm. if in healthcare we don't stop and take care of self mm -hmm. and give each other permission to do that. And I had even seen some signs and symptoms that I kind of was like, ah, eh, maybe, you know, I think we're okay. We just kind of kept going in go mode. And I was like, okay, that doesn't work. If I'm the charge nurse on this floor, I have to stop and pay attention to those things. Um, and it just is an example of how you can't separate your personal life with your work life. Yeah. Yeah. So things come together and, um, you know, as a leader, you can't be responsible for it, but you right. can maybe be alert to and, and acknowledge there's probably a lot of stuff going on in mm -hmm. home life mm -hmm. that's brought into work. Mm -hmm. or how can you influence some of that, too? But I do remember you being there as a leader. And again, one of those things where I think you could probably sense for our floor this was really hard and again you know you didn't necessarily have all the answers but you were there mm -hmm. you were kind of going through it with us and saying together we'll just recover and and you know we learned from it um which was probably about as good as things could have possibly gone in a really hard circumstance um, but again that courageous leadership to go 
this is really hard, but we've got to do it. We've got to tackle what's in front of us. So how did you take all that you've learned? Like I just laid out a few little snapshots and I'm just one little person that was in that world. <laughs> you had like <laughs> hundreds of thousands of people in the world. And then you went on to take this to like thousands and thousands within a whole healthcare system as the chief transformational officer. Because people recognize like you could change things, like you would drive change. So how did you take it from kind of this beautiful Woodwinds Health Campus to then multiple hospitals and clinics on a much larger scale? Like how similar or different is that? The idea was to take the things that went well at Woodwinds and mm -hmm. spread them out to the other hospitals that are were affiliated with the organization. Um, so, you know, I would share ideas, I would coach the leadership, mm -hmm. um, and I think there were some changes made. I think that it's difficult, you know, it's that balance of responsibility and authority. Mm -hmm. I had the responsibility for doing it, but I I wasn't the CEO of all of of everything. Right, right. So how so there I ran yeah. into that challenge. Yeah. So how do you get it yeah. implemented? Which was I think the way I tried to do that yeah. at least was yeah. to try to influence yeah. through influence through motivation, mm -hmm. through sharing the facts, every everybody sees in our is motivated by different things. Mm -hmm. Some financial, some mm -hmm. you know patient outcomes, um, a variety of reasons. But you know, show me the facts. Right. So that's the way I tried to influence. Okay. Because um, we were you know innovative at Woodwinds, and it was viewed a, like we were considered the learning lab. Yeah, yeah. So it's really trying to, to share the things that we had learned. It was interesting because I, um, I think that people from outside of the organization, mm -hmm. the broader organization, mm -hmm. um, were more open to learning from us at some, at some mm -hmm. points in time than, than, you know, our siblings within the same organization. Sure. So we had tours and people wanting to um, learn from us from a variety of things from all over the world. I mean, yeah. that was an interesting yeah. part um, of everything, just that, you know, we were able to do this yeah. on a smaller scale and, and they were wanting to spread it. Um, and it was interesting because I could, the minute people would come, whether mm -hmm. it was internal or external to the organization, mm -hmm. and say, well, just um, if they would come and say, tell me what the top three things are that you do. Mm -hmm. And I want to know this in 10 minutes. And I can tell right <laughs> away that you're not going to get it. Right. It's a little it's, longer than 10 minutes. Well, yeah. But I can almost tell within yeah. 10 minutes yeah. whether they really were going to be able to grasp okay. what we were doing, how to do it, yeah. why we were doing it, yeah. the, the essence behind it. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe they just wanted to know how to create healing gardens. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. Mm -hmm. it, it wasn't one thing that made the whole experience for patients mm -hmm. work. It was a million little things. Mm -hmm. But interesting that you met more resistance maybe internally mm -hmm. than externally. And, and I can kind of see that, you know, in retrospect. Right. Um, and you were given like this runway to do a lot. Mm -hmm. And was that sometimes met with kind of, oh, what's the right word? I mean, I don't want to say jealousy, but a little, little bit of like envy from fellow leaders, maybe in other hospitals. I think it was, I think just envy at doing woodwinds because yeah. we were allowed to be the learning lab and it got a lot of attention publicity yeah. um, within and outside of the organization mm -hmm. for a number of years we were given more capital to, mm. to build yep. and yeah. um, which i can totally understand all of it yeah um so so there was that component um and and who am i as yeah. a leader to tell my peers how to do it better sure you know so there was you know, I think there was a little sensitivity mm -hmm. going on there. Mm -hmm. Not that people didn't try to, for sure. I, I think part of the resistance, and interestingly enough, was in some of the nursing leadership, mm. yeah. um, other places. Yeah. Because we had such, that if you think about a lot of the things that we did, it was around nursing. Yeah, that's true. So that was the core that, that really could overflow into yeah. all of the areas we were trying to uh, influence. Yeah. And if there wasn't that buy-in from nursing leadership, um, I think they were maybe a little more 
hesitant, let okay. me say, not resistant, but hesitant. Okay, okay. Thinking that the science wasn't sound enough or right. the impact big enough? I think the science and and maybe was it easier to do it the way we've always done it? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. And how do you, so like from, from the MBA mindset then, and I think a lot of people don't understand that healthcare, because some things in healthcare have erroneous price tags mm -hmm. that can sometimes feel like big barriers to treatment and care. But the reality is when you look at things from a 30,000 foot view, as a CEO of a hospital or healthcare system, the profit margin is like very slim, mm -hmm. often in the red, right? So it's it's not this huge, massively profitable business to run mm -hmm. um, as an MBA. Mm -hmm. And I think is that kind of, does that come down to like how do you equate dollars to life and death situations all the time? Like the two just like are so tough to intersect or, or how do you handle that as, as your MBA brain? Like I need to have a solid business that's running well, but I get the tough decisions have really big, um, you know, outcome mm -hmm. potential or fall or failure. You can imagine the CFOs in my life have always asked that question yeah, and yeah. that have been on the team. Um, I would say that if you provide the best quality, yeah. hire the best people, and create the best culture, your finances will follow. Uh, and we prove that to be true. Mm -hmm. So it isn't that it's not a focus. Mm -hmm. It just isn't the number one focus, which mm -hmm. I think a lot of people make the mistake that has to be number one. It isn't number one. It's it's very important. Mm -hmm. can't survive without it. Mm -hmm. um, but you do the other things right, and I think the finance will follow mm -hmm. because you're going to you're going to have the best staff. Mm -hmm. You're going to have them the most collaborative, mm -hmm. the most engaged, mm -hmm. the less turnover, mm -hmm. the best satisfaction. They're going to provide the best quality. Yep. The best quality is going to really flow into the best finances. Yeah, yeah. So. But don't lead with that. No. Yeah. No. Yeah, especially in healthcare because you see people. You see the minute you start talking budget, people are like, all right. right. No, exactly. They're like, do you know what I'm trying to do in that room? No. <laughs> like, and, it's and really you hard. Still, you still need that. But you do. But it's a business. It's a business. You, yeah. you need that. You can't forget about that yeah. for sure. But. You just don't necessarily like lead with it, but it's it's still very important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then it's a better matter of making some decisions and they're hard decisions. Mm -hmm. Even having said that, mm -hmm. um, budgets are always tough. Mm -hmm. Again, bringing people to the table to say, this is what we have to work with. Mm -hmm. What's the priority this right. year or the long term? Do we make some short term sacrifices for the long term? Mm -hmm. Bringing people around the table to help make those decisions, yeah. uh, I think is important. It's crucial. Mm -hmm. Probably one of the more challenging places to be a CFO, which, yeah, I probably didn't necessarily, you know, give that all the credit over the years, but what a tough job to be a CFO with the budgets I think many hospitals and healthcare systems have. Yeah. For sure. They can be influenced, though. Yeah. I remember when I was getting my MBA and, and I was, they have a lot of, you know, groups. And so I was with the group of, I think they were three finance guys and mm -hmm. me, and they were all part of for-profit organizations, okay. and I was not-for-profit. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And uh, I was working at Children's Hospital in St. Paul mm -hmm. at the time, and okay. so we were working on a, a pseudo-budget that we were creating, yeah. and we had taken turns going to each each other's organizations yeah. um, to do scenarios that mm -hmm. we had to present back to our MBA class. And when it was my turn, my scenario was around health care, obviously, mm -hmm. and I brought them to Children's Hospital, and I brought them, they gowned up, they went mm -hmm. into the OR with obvious permission from the parents and stuff mm -hmm. on a case that wasn't going to make money and had mm -hmm. them as a CFO say, what would they do? Ooh. So you That's can intense. make, yeah. you're not going to make money in one area. Yeah. It was clear what they said. I mean, they right. were like, sure, you know. Right, <laughs> right. Um, but, so you're not going to make money in one area, but helping mm -hmm. them understand mm -hmm. This, this is part of what we need mm -hmm. to do. Mm -hmm. How do we figure that out mm -hmm. um, to make it happen, even though we're going to lose money on this right. particular 
procedure, surgical procedure, whatever. But if it's you or your loved one, mm -hmm. the answer is yes. Let's when do it. I see them now, they still talk about that. Oh my God, you made us go up there and put scrubs on and that. <laughs> you kind of have to walk through the process to grasp the they gravity had, they of it. They didn't have any clue. They were from like 3M, from Ecolab, from some other places that yeah. really didn't hadn't these guys had been CFOs mm -hmm. and had never gotten into any clinical areas mm -hmm. um, to really see where some of the results of mm -hmm. the work that they did mm -hmm. you know played itself out right right and Julie can you just briefly share because I think this is another confusing topic for a lot of people but there's nonprofit hospitals mm -hmm. and healthcare systems and for-profit mm -hmm. and like how do those operate in similar or you know manners that are very different from one another Currently in the state of Minnesota, there are no for-profit hospitals. Mm -hmm. There's always, some of us consider the threat that that could happen, yeah. but there are for-profit hospitals in other states, yeah. um, Humana, well, some of the other ones, they're, they're huge for-profit, and I always, the profits in, in Minnesota hospitals range anywhere from, you know, two and a half percent right. to maybe seven percent on a good year. Yeah. So very slim margins. Yeah. In fact, I had a friend um, tell me he worked for 3M, and, and at the time, anything, any product line they had that was below 25 percent, forget done. it, it's done. Wow. Well, You're like, so, <laughs> yeah. And, and so that's why it's tough yeah. managing finances in healthcare because the profits are so slim. Mm -hmm. Just they're, they're, you have don't have a lot of no squeak room at all. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So how about, you know, kind of reining it back in now to um, employee well-being? Because we talk a lot about, you know, I mean, clearly in healthcare we're promoting patient well-being, but um, a lot of kind of our focus is in kind of that employee well-being side of things too. Can you share something that you saw work really well around employee well-being and something that was like, oh, that doesn't ever need to be repeated? No, I think the thing that comes to mind about what worked really well is offering the um, alternative or integrative services to yeah. the staff for for the most part for free yeah and I think they saw that as a gift and mm -hmm. um, that they could experience it and if they had a bad day they could call up to see if they had if there was someone to give them acupuncture yeah. or some energy work or uh, biofeedback or things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so I think they felt like we really cared about mm -hmm. them mm -hmm. and then they could go forward and do their job better. Mm -hmm. So I think that really worked. Yeah. And, and again, it's that bringing in a lot of things from home. They right. may have had tough situations. Mm -hmm. um, that's not the way they wanted to present to their patients. Mm -hmm. So they could call for help um, mm -hmm. from that perspective. Mm -hmm. What didn't work well? Hmm. I'm sure there were things that didn't work well. Right. It just off the top of my yeah. head, I'm not thinking. I think all the cookies and, and food and stuff, uh, they loved that. That yeah. all worked well. Maybe not for their pants fitting, but, you know. Right. <laughs> for, yeah, it's like an immediate, that felt right. good. But, yeah, kind of that long term. I yeah. have to think about that one. Okay, okay. And how do you incorporate like health for your own self now? You know, maybe if you can talk about that, like when you were a leader and, and now in your life, is it the same? Is it different? Like what advice would you have for people? You who... know, there are some things that are the same, um, like planning our, our uh, breaks, mm. even though we're both retired, we, we're very yeah. busy and uh, it's still important to, and I'm in charge of our vacations and, yeah. and our breaks and things. So I make sure that happens. You know what? What I really have to be purposeful about mm -hmm. is um, keeping engaged in what's going on in the world mm -hmm. and finding new opportunities to be involved. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. that's so important. Yeah. And it's not just busy, but yeah. to really, really add something of value. Yeah. So that would be something I try to do. Of course, our financial health, our emotional health, um, our spiritual health. Yeah. Um, is very important. So yeah. all of these things are important, and I think, like throughout my life, some have got are in good. Bit. Sometimes I'm in good balance. Sometimes I'm not. Sure. So that's the same as it's always been, yeah. and I have to sort of regroup. Yeah. I mean, one thing that's hitting me right now is that um, 
I love my kids, and mm-hmm. I love to spend every minute with them, so I'm trying mm-hmm. to let them have their own lives mm-hmm. and um, not for me to be involved in every single thing, which, sure. of course, I'd love to. Right. Um, but um, so, and to take delight and pleasure in the fact that they're wonderful, mm-hmm. interesting people mm-hmm. and that they have their own lives mm-hmm. and that I need to have my own life. Yeah, yeah, So I can see that. When and I... you'll, you'll find that as you're... As your girls get uh-huh. older too, uh-huh. right now you think they would, they wish they would get their own life. But <laughs> right. Once they do, you'll really miss them. So. I know, and we have a couple in that stage, and then a couple, you yes, know, ones yes. at home. So I, I, I am seeing that flip already. Right. Um, but you also have really awesome kids. I'm yeah. fortunate to know I do. them, so I can see where you want to spend a lot of time with them because they're they're really awesome humans. Mm-hmm. On that note, like, how did you balance being this driven, successful woman? Like you paralleled um, when I was introducing you to Lisa here at Self Esteem Brands, like you, you're kind of the mother of woodwinds, and I think your legacy is like still so strong there, and probably always will be. But you also were like a real life mother, and for a time a single mother. Mm-hmm. And so, how did you balance? Like, how do you balance all of that and keep yourself intact? You know, I, I'm just driven, yeah. and and sometimes it's been to my detriment, and maybe the detriment of my children because I was. I was busy all the time. I was, I was, um, I'm always, my, my big, my big driver is a challenge. Anybody mm-hmm. puts a challenge in front of me and says mm-hmm. that you'll never be able to do this, which they said about woodwinds. Right. You can darn well <laughs> bet I was going to do like, I'm surely going to uh, do this. Definitely. Yeah. Um, so I think it is a big balancing act. Yeah. When I think back to how busy I was and then, um, it, getting remarried and yeah. adding another bunch of children and mm-hmm. and, and a husband to my life. Mm-hmm. Um, when I think back now, it's like, oh, my God, how did I do that? Yeah. But you just do what you have to do. Sure. Um, so I probably didn't have very good balance at all uh, at that time. time. Yeah. Uh, and taking care of the sick parent and, you know, yeah. so mm-hmm. it, it's it's a lot, but... I have more time to reflect now yeah. and to really think about what's important, what, you know, how, you know, how do I balance things yeah. better? Yeah. Um, what well, do I want to be involved in? Where do I want to spend my time? Right. What would you tell your younger self, your 45 year old self, kind of when you're at the peak of the drive, like what wisdom now do you hold that you wish someone maybe would have sprinkled a little bit in your ear at that time? I would, at 45, I was just starting to figure out balance should look like Mm -hmm. um and so maybe maybe thinking slow down and pause take a pause Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in fact one of my kids who you know i gave um, my son and his wife a pause as a gift for christmas cool gift yeah what did that look like just to take a pause it was a box that said pause in the inside And then it was a book that talked about how important a pause was hmm. to life. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's a book that I've had for a while, but um, I thought he, they know how important it is. Mm-hmm. They're probably at the same stage I was at their age. Sure. So it, it's a good reminder to take a pause. So mm-hmm. I think take a pause would be take advice to my younger self. It's different. Like knowing and doing, right? Right, it's two different things. For sure. And now, I mean, you probably have had the knowledge for so long, but now you have the reflective wisdom of going, mm-hmm. like, I need to do it, right? And maybe saying, like, I could have done it a little more in there, but it, it's that's so tricky when you're so I, driven. You know, and then I keep thinking, what wouldn't I do? And I can't think of one thing, yeah. you know. So. Yeah. But you're one of those few people who, from my observation, I think you just did it incredibly, incredibly well. So I I just kind of want it to be like an inspiration for people who, I mean, feel like they can only do so much or go so far. You know, you you did it all really well. And I don't mean perfectly, but you did it all really well. And And everybody has their own style, right? Mm -hmm. And my style was to really be driven and... Mm -hmm. um, don't let any grass grow under my feet, all the, that kind of thing. But everybody yeah. has their own way, and I don't know that there's a right way. Sure. That's a great answer. There's yeah. just a way that's going to work for you, and you have to find it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Okay. Thank you for that. I love that. I think that's really inspiring for me as I'm kind of, you know, now moving into that different phase of life. Like I feel it. Mm -hmm. I'm like, do I just accept that? And I'm like, it's kind of beautiful a little bit when you get to this place of realizing your drive is important. Courage is important. All of those things matter, but equally, you know, kind of recalibrating and, and filling up your cup and pausing is equally as important. Mm -hmm. And one can't sustain itself with at least an element of the other. Well, and to realize we are a role model for our children too. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. they'll do it maybe as well as, as they see us do it. Yeah. So that yeah. could be a, a driver to yeah. help us be better yeah. too. It's a great point. So we're sitting here inside the self-esteem brand corporate tattoo room. Have you been in a corporate tattoo room? I before? have not. Do you think those could ever exist in healthcare? Well, you have to tell me what it's all about first. <laughs> it's like, cause you could okay. do it. If anybody <laughs> would, could do it, it'd be you. Um, but it's where they've literally built this room where, I mean, they have about, I think 5,000 Anytime Fitness club owners, members, leaders that have the Anytime Fitness tattoo. And I've always kind of thought, could this exist in healthcare? Like, could you love a brand, like a healthcare mm -hmm. brand I so know much? I what mine would be. I was going to ask you, what would yours be? Mine would be, imagine the possibilities. Mm. And that's what you've done. So mm -hmm. that was my MO. It mm -hmm. will be for my life. It's, I didn't, mm -hmm. I'm not the original maker of that brand, but, but it's like, just imagine mm -hmm. what the possibilities mm -hmm. could be. Mm -hmm. Isn't that it's, awesome that to makes, think about? Yeah. It's very inspiring. Like it feels like a door opened yeah. where so many things otherwise feel like it closed. Right. That's beautiful. Okay, well, if you want to get one, you could. Not like today, <laughs> but someday you probably could get one here that says that if you want okay. to. So, All right. Awesome. Yeah, so keep that in mind. All right. But yeah, but thank you, Julie. I just so enjoy time with you, learning from you, um, and just appreciate all that you've taught me along the way. Um, you've had a huge influence in my life, and I'm excited to expose others to all of the wealth of wisdom, um, both in life and in work that you carry. So thank you for spending this time. I've always um, believed that at Woodwinds, we were planting seeds, mm -hmm. right? We were mm -hmm. planting seeds that would we needed to nourish water so that they would grow and be spread around all over. And mm -hmm. you're one of those seeds. Mm -hmm. So look you. what you've done. It's been amazing. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. It is um, about as close to a 180 as you can get from where I started when I walked into Woodwinds about, you know, 25 years ago. But it's been a great journey. And I honestly can say, having observed a nurse leader with incredible courage and incredible impact, I was like, you know what? I am not going to sell myself short. Like, I'm just going to think of all, and, uh, imagine the possibilities. And you haven't, which so. is awesome. So, yeah, imagine the possibilities. Yeah. So, and you thank have you. too. Thank you for planting that seed. Yes. I appreciate you. I appreciate this time today. It was a great conversation and I'm sure it's going to inspire and change many people's mindsets. So thank you, Julie, for being here. I You're appreciate welcome. it. Yes. Thank you. I want to say a special thank you to everyone at Self Esteem Brands, the parent company of Anytime Fitness, Waxing the City, Bar Method, Stronger You Nutrition, and Base Camp Fitness. We are grateful for the recording space and support you have provided to our podcast platform and team. You are a true example of what it means to rebel and be well. You can learn more about self-esteem brands via the link shared in the show notes below. We appreciate and savor every sip of Dry Farm Wines during our podcast conversations and every event at The Point Retreats. As a health and wellness platform, we are grateful to have a pure and unique wine that is free of sugar and additives, grown on small family farms, and brings a bright and soulful and vibrant glass of wine to share with the community we love. Cheers to our Dry Farm wine friends and family. You can learn more and order your own bottles of Dry Farm wine by clicking the link provided in the show notes below. That simple and serene moment when we glide across the lake at the Point Retreats on our Paddle North paddleboard is one of the most cherished moments. It's a gift when we and our guests blend into nature and lose track of time and space as we soar across the pristine whitefish chain of lakes. Thank you Paddle North for being our preferred Minnesota-based brand and company. 
We honor every memorable paddle that brings great clarity and balance. Click on the link provided in the show notes below to see all the incredible lake gear available with Paddle North. The Point Retreats and Rentals is situated roughly 30 minutes outside Brainerd, Minnesota. The property's private peninsula boasts over 1,500 feet of stunning shoreline, spanning three lakes on the whitefish chain of lakes. The Point property is owned by two purpose-driven leaders who share a strong desire to lead others to optimal health and well-being. Our team believes in proactive, modern-day health, shifting our mindsets to valuing quality of life in the same capacity as we value quantity of life. We aim for every experience at the point to enhance and deepen your whole being health by providing many opportunities for well care during your stay. Whether you need time to renew, reset, or reconnect, we have a space that can host your family, group, or team. Click on the show notes below to find out more about the point retreats and the point rentals.